Hey, what's going on, everybody? Kestova back here with another problem for everyone. Uh, this time, we're going to take what we have been working on in terms of um, statics, and we're going to be applying it with uh, a material. So this time, we have a simply supported uh, concrete beam, and the question is, what's the required area of steel to adequately support the moment? So we have concrete beam as depicted, simply supported, span of 15 feet. And then we have a one kip per linear foot live load being applied onto the beam. All right, let's jump into it. So first, what I like to do with concrete is you want to you wanna make sure you have all your properties together. Um, it's the most important thing, both of the, the properties of the steel and of the concrete, because you have two different, two different materials there. So what we have is a cross section. I just drew a cross section of the beam, which is if you look up here, that AA section, that's, that's the typical type of nomenclature in the professional world. And then you see next to here, section AA. So just a little um, tidbit for you there when you start to get into um, your professional life, you start to see stuff like that and how what's most common practice. Um, but in our beam, you have the width of a beam, you have your base width, so BW, then you have your height of your beam, H, and you have D of your beam, which is the height from the top of the beam down to the center line of your, or the centroid of your reinforcing steel. So if you had multiple layers of steel, it would be the centroid, not, not just the lowest mat of the steel. So in this case, we just have one row of steel. So it's, this, it, it's from the top of the beam to the center line of the steel. And that steel is being designated as uh, AS, area of steel. So we have, um, so again, th these properties were given to us in this problem. And we're trying to solve for how much steel is required to make this beam work. So we have a base width of 12 inches. We have a height of 18 inches. And we have a clear cover of 2 inches. So clear cover is that minimum cover from the outside face of the beam to the steel. And that is that clear cover can vary depending on your conditions, your environmental conditions. Is it in you know uh, um, a salt, a very heavily salted area like coastline, or in the northeast where they salt their roads, um, or it can come into effect on if you have like grade beams or when when earth is cast directly against concrete. Um, that's a big um, driving force uh, of what type of clear cover distances are required. But in this case, you just have a clear cover of two inches. So we can find our D from that, which is your H, 18 inches, minus two inch clear cover, and then minus another half inch. That's just kind of a standard practice of, it's not your, your diameter of your bar, whatever it may be. Um, probably isn't going to be one full inch. That's like a number nine bar. That's pretty, that's pretty big, but you're, it's just good practice. To take half of that diameter of whatever bar you have. So we're going to assume a half inch and just to be slightly conservative, it's probably smaller than that. But so overall your D is 15.5 inches. Um, next we have the F prime C of our concrete. So that's the compressive strength, or comp excuse me, the compressive stress of your uh, concrete. So F prime C compression. Um, and that is 4,000 PSI is what was given to us, or 4 KSI you can also um, have that as. It's the same thing. Uh, and then your FY, um, your yielding stress, is of the steel, and that is 60,000 PSI or 60 KSI. That's very common. That's the most common uh, rebar uh, yield stress nowadays. Um, and uh, your compressive stress of concrete can range anywhere from like 3,000. Uh, I mean, you can go way up. You can go to like 8,000 if you want some some high strength concrete. But but typically, it's between four and 5,000 PSI for concrete. So in this case, we have 4,000 PSI and 60,000 PSI for reinforcing all right, so those are our properties. The next thing we want to do is determine our self-weight of the beam. Um, so we can take that by 
Um, we know the unit weight of concrete uh, is 150 pounds per cubic foot. And if we take our cross-sectional area, which is 12 inches, which is the base width, times 18 inches, which is the height, you want the full height here. Since those are in inches, you want to divide by 144 inches squared per foot squared, and that gets you um, square feet per foot. And then we know, uh, actually, so we can just stop there. So you can either, if you're someone who's starting out, I used to do this when I first started, by getting the full weight of the beam and then dividing it by the length of the beam to get a, you know, a kips per linear foot or weight per linear foot. But you're kind of doing two things. You're you're multiplying by the length once you have this um, part of the equation, and then you're just dividing by the length. But that's just how my brain worked early on. Um, so we can do that if you like, but how I do it now is just your cross-sectional area of the beam times your unit weight, or your yeah, your unit weight of your concrete. So that comes out to be 0 0.225 kips per lineal foot. So I've also, in this not shown, I've divided by 1,000. So we have pounds per cubic foot going to kips. So, And self-weight of the beam, that's always a dead load. So I designate it by DL, whereas above in the original problem, I've designated your live load, LL. All right. So we have our dead load. Now, for concrete, this is like pretty much always. Um, next, we need to, uh, to determine our load case. And you can either do ASD or LRFD. Um, for concrete, I can't even think of a situation where I've used ASD. Um, you want to use, as a rule of thumb, LRFD for concrete all the time. Um, steel, you can use either. You know, your steel manual has both, um, you know, regularly back and forth between both methods. Um, wood, you want to stick to the ASD side. It's a lot easier than LRFD. And then uh, masonry. Um, I haven't worked too much with masonry, but you can go back and forth with that as well. Um, but yeah, for best practice, always keep LRFD method for concrete. So um, our controlling method, if you're looking, and you can find the equations for LRFD and ASD in the ASCE 716, um, that's the code book, uh, in chapter two for under load cases. So the controlling load case for this is 1.2 dead load plus 1.6 live load. And when we plug in our dead load that we saw for before times 1.2 and we plug in our live load from above of 1 KLF times 1.6, that gets us a total distributed load of 1.87 kips per lineal foot. All right, moving on. Next, we want to determine the maximum moment. So a little free body diagram. We all know that. Um, just a simply supported beam, 15 feet long. We have a combined distributed load of 1.87 kips per linear foot. That takes into dead load and live load, all the weight acting on the beam. Um, talked about this last time. You can cut this beam and solve for the moment, but... That's going to take a little bit of time, and we know this is a simply supported beam. So we know from my previous videos, you can jump into the AISC, um, table 3-23, page 3-213, if you want to do it by pages. And we know that the maximum moment for a simply supported beam with a distributed load is WL squared over 8. Plug in that 1.87 kips per linear foot for W, 15 feet for L, it gets just uh, a maximum moment, bending moment, of 52.6 kip feet. Cool. Easy. That was, like, super easy compared to what we were doing before. Big time saver. It's all about knowing where to find stuff and how to make it easier for you. Um, engineering doesn't always have to be hard. You just want to figure out where to find the information to make your life a lot easier. Uh, determine the area of steel required. That's our next step here, and that's our final step. So... What I like to do is, I usually like to guess, um, kind of a rough estimate, and you'll get better at this as you go, of how much steel you might need, um, and then you can run through and determine if you have enough moment capacity or not. And that I find to be one of the easiest ways, um, instead of getting into um, a different method 
basically of your stress and strains and your relations that way. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I prefer it this way. It's a lot more um, comprehensible in my opinion. And so your areas, your total area of steel. So we're going to try three number fives. Um, one number five bar, the area of steel is 0 0.13 inches squared. That's its cross section of one bar of a number five times three, because we're going to try three of them. So your total area of steel, 0 0.93 inches squared. Now we know that the tension force in the beam of the steel or the tension capacity equals area of steel times your yield stress, Fy. And we also know for compression that you have 0 0.85 um, compression times the compression stress times your base width times your A. We also know that T equals C. And from those equations, that kind of breaks down. We, I won't go into like depth into this, but just real basic here. You have your bars at the bottom here. That's your tension force acting here. Um, and then you have your compression force at the top of the beam. And what's happening is as that beam bends, um, you get tension action on the rods, on the reinforcing below, and then you have compression in the top of the beam pushing into itself. Um, and these two forces need to count be equal to one another in order to maintain equilibrium. So that's where these two equations come in. It's just your area of steel times your um, yielding stress for the tension, so that's really easy. And then compression, that 0.85 um, comes into, if you were to really break this down, um, kind of a weird, um, in reality, let's see if I can draw it here. You actually have like a um, compression zone that kind of looks something like this. And what they've done through testing um, over the years is they've they've kind of chopped off this this portion down here um, with that curve on it and just made a square box and slapped on uh, a factor of 0 0.85 to, to make up for that um, to simplify it a little bit, but they still shown through testing that, that that equals, that compression zone is still equal to one another. So that's where that 0 0.85 comes from. But again, I'm not getting very in depth with it, so I'm not probably giving you a straight answer and I can do another video next time on that. Um, so with these three equations, uh, we can, we can set them equal to one another, um, cause we know that T equals C. So these two things equal one another and we, we know everything except for a, so a, which is this value here is what we want to find. Um, so we set them equal to one another and all we do is take me right down here these values and we bring them over to the other side and that way we can solve for a so that's what you have down here and then we just plug in for everything that we know we know as we know fy 0.85 is just a factor um, we know f prime c and we know base width that gets us a and that comes out to inches so 1.4 inches roughly now, for a moment, capacity, we know that MN equals ASFY. In that case, that's just your T, if you think about it, um, times uh, parenthesis D minus A over 2. And now, I want to show you guys quickly what this equation actually is. It's, you, just, you don't want to just blindly follow equations. You want to start to break down and figure out where are they coming from. So when you start to get into more advanced problems, you realize you, you can either realize you have all the components or that you don't have all the components and things aren't making sense. So for this equation, we know that moment is just force times perpendicular distance. And so what we have here, ASFY, that's inches squared of steel times your yield stress, which is um, PSI or KSI. So when you multiply those together, that either gets you kips or pounds. So that's a force. So this right here is your force. Okay, force times perpendicular distance. That means the rest of this has to be your perpendicular distance. Um, so D 
if we look back up here, you're going, well, what, where's our moment arm in this? That doesn't make sense to me. So what's happening is the, the moment is internal. The compression zone and the tension zone are in uh, unison, are in equilibrium with, not, with one another. So you have internal moment happening in either direction. Um, and you kind of have a pivot point about one another. And what's happening is your moment arm is actually D minus A over 2, which means that it's coming from the center point of that compression zone down to the center point of your tension zone. That is your moment arm. So you're getting this internal moment of the beam bending, and that's where your, your force times your perpendicular distance. So if you have this force times this distance has to equal, and you know that your C equals your T, that means that this C moment arm needs to be equal to the T's moment arm. So hence, this is they, they both share the same moment arm because they are the same. That's where that equation comes from. So we plug in for everything because we know everything now. We solved A. And we this will dump out um, kip inch. So we want to slap on and divide by 12 to get kip feet. And we get MN equals 68.9 kip feet. But we're not done yet. We also need to apply our phi factor because that was just to solve for MN. So our phi factor, which is a factor of safety applied in case there's many reasons why it's there, but in as a professional engineer, basically your factors of safety are, are exactly what you think they'd be. They're, they're for safety. Um, you know, we run these equations every single day, and no matter how good we get, we still have human error, and they help kind of pad um, but the structures that we build, because we can't we can't keep track of any everything, unfortunately, perfectly. Um, so that's one of the reason, many reasons why we have these these fee factors in here. And there could be defects in the materials. Um, your steel could be low adequate, uh, not yeah. I mean, just a crappy steel. Um, your concrete could have not been mixed right in the field. So a bunch of stuff to take into account as to where these number these factors of safety come from. Um, for Bending capacity for concrete, your fee is 0 0.9. This is just basic. Um, it can change, though, and that gets into more depth that I'll go into again in further videos. But for now, we're just going to assume 0 0.9. That's most of the time what it is. So you have MN of 68.9. Multiply it by 0 0.9. That brings your capacity of your beam down to 62 kip feet, which is greater than your um, ultimate moment, bending moment of 52.6 kip feet. So we know that we have adequate capacity, and that's actually decently close. We could probably trim up the amount of steel a little bit more, but in terms of constructability, which means how easy it's to construct in the field, um, which is a big deal for professional engineers, um, once you get out of school, you realize that, because uh, time is money after all that this this is completely adequate. This is fine. Um, you, you don't want to be getting into, well, I can do two number fives and one number four or two number fours and one number. They're not going to do any of that. They're going to say, the contractor is going to say, give me one piece of steel and I'll buy a bunch of it and I'll, I'll make it work for as many cases as I can. And that's what we've, we're going to try to stick to. Keep it simple. So um, and there, there you have it. So we've proven that three number five bars is adequate for um, the capacity of the concrete beam that spans 15 feet. Uh, as always, um, please like and subscribe. Uh, leave any comments below on any questions you might have um, or any questions you want answered in the future. Um, we have the school year starting up here uh, in Oregon, so feel free to send out any questions you may have so I can get them started for you and get them answered. Till next time, everybody. Thanks. See ya.